I'd like to sincerely thank the organizers uh, for this uh, warm invitation. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be able to uh, give a speech in front of this uh, distinguished audience. Thank you. Um, Son, um, first of all, uh, we heard yesterday already from Professor Basido about the history of the Hague Conference, and it started as an um, organization or uh, meetings and to unify private international rules within Europe, and then that has been uh, gradually extended to uh, other regions. Today, we are in the era of globalization, and at the same time, it's a time of regionalization. So we see uh, a regional economic integration, um, particularly in Europe, um, and uh, North and South uh, America, Africa, and also in Asia, we are gradually uh, coming together. Um, and that um, poses, uh, in some respect, challenges for adapting or joining Hague Conventions, in my eyes. So um, uh, I'd like to uh, analyze, first of all, from the perspective of Asian jurisdictions, um, how far uh, we have joined the Hague Conventions. And uh, uh, secondly, I'd like to focus uh, on the point how um, possible uh, future paths can be sought at the Hague Conference. So first of all, um, the Hague Conference um, has been successful, of course, in family matters uh, with administrative corporations. Uh, if we look at uh, the Asian jurisdictions, uh, we have um, quite a number of uh, member states for the 1980 Child Abduction Convention and also 1993 Inter-Country Adoption Convention. However, if we look at uh, further um, the member states of the 1996 Child Protection Convention, there are uh, all over the world uh, 47 states, but um, no country uh, from Asia so far. And also for the 2007 Child Support Convention and Protocol, there are uh, 39 or 30 states uh, in the world that are member states, but. Uh, uh, not yet from Asia. So I have to here uh, say that um, I define Asia um, as a region uh, that stretches um, from the east, from Japan till uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, that's the definition given by the J uh, Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs. So please allow me to use uh, this definition of Asia. In any case, um, although uh, there have been um, quite a number of states that have joined 1980 and 1993 conventions, um, 1996 and 2000 um, have not uh, gained um, yet any countries from this region. As a background, um, I'd like to point out that um, Asian jurisdictions are quite diverse. So if we think about uh, divorce and as a uh, basic uh, family law institutions, uh, there are um, quite a number of countries that uh, accept consensual divorce, namely South Korea, Japan, mainland China, Taiwan, and Thailand, whereas uh, in the Philippines there is not yet divorce as a legal institution. There are also jurisdictions that are based on religious or customary personal laws so that uh, family law institutions are split among persons that uh, are uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, and Pakistan. And there are um, two common law jurisdictions, namely Hong Kong and Singapore, whereas uh, the other uh, jurisdictions are based on civil law. So this um, diversity uh, poses a certain challenge uh, if we think about um, how to promote the Hague Conventions in this region. At the same time, um, what is remarkable in this uh, region is that uh, family law institutions are largely based on traditional notion of families. That means that uh, family law institutions are largely bound to heterosexual marriage, so that um, no legal protection has so far been provided for same-sex couples, unlike in the Western countries. Uh, the only exception is Taiwan, where the Constitutional Court decided uh, last year that um, because of the uh, equality of the protection of couples, um, 
it is uh, supposed to uh, introduce same-sex marriage or same-sex protections um, in the future, but still the legislature uh, needs to take an action uh, to introduce this um, uh, institution so that uh, we still have to wait um, Taiwan to introduce a certain legal protection for same-sex couples. We still have um, most jurisdictions such as differences between legitimate and illegitimate children. It's almost, uh, in my eyes, um, against uh, the um, UN Convention on the uh, Children's Rights to say legitimate or illegitimate children. But still, uh, we do have these provisions in our statutes, and that's uh, the state uh, of affairs in Asian jurisdictions. And parental responsibilities are only shared so far as the parents are married. So for uh, unmarried couples, uh, there are no shared parental responsibilities, and after divorce, um, only one parent becomes uh, the sole custodian. And uh, also because of these uh, rather traditional and conventional family law institutions, rights and obligations are not, um, so to say, clearly stipulated in our statutes, and that um, causes uh, difficulties in enforcement. So because uh, rights and obligations are not explicitly defined in our statutes, um, providing uh, certain rights or obligations uh, in court decisions uh, is already um, uh, causes some difficulties and enforcement uh, also becomes some difficulties. So this um, uh, the picture um, of the Asian jurisdictions um, poses uh, certain challenges for the Hague Conventions in family matters. But uh, in my eyes, um, the Hague Conventions, particularly 1996 and 2007 conventions, uh, that have not yet gained um, Asian jurisdiction so far, are useful uh, mechanisms. And uh, they are also uh, very practical um, in terms of uh, providing practical solutions um, in uh, dealing with cross-border family uh, relationships. So um, by pointing out the usefulness, um, I think um, it is possible to encourage Asian countries to join more uh, the Hague Conventions. So um, if you think about uh, the 1996 Child Protection Convention, uh, this uh, works quite well to support and uh, complement the 1980 Child Abduction Convention. So once a child is abducted uh, from state A to state B, then under the 1980 Child Abduction Convention, the child is supposed to um, be returned to state A immediately. And in order to guarantee the safe return of the child, the 1996 Convention serves, first of all, that uh, custody order uh, to be rendered by state A, where the child uh, is, uh, is habitual resident, is to be recognized among member states of the 1996 convention. And when uh, in state B, where a child is uh, temporarily staying, uh, some urgent protective orders become necessary, then again, 1996 convention provides these uh, possibilities, and th that kind of orders can be uh, recognized and enforced in other states. And that um, provides an, um, supportive measures uh, to guarantee the safe return of the child to state A, and uh, um, in that case, uh, we do not need to use mirror orders or safe harbor orders to uh, guarantee the safe return of the child. So that's a very useful mechanism, and also in order to guarantee access of the child in state B. And uh, this morning we already heard about uh, the uh, future possible project um, of mediation. So if uh, parents reach an agreement in state B, that uh, after the return of the child to state A, the father shall pay the maintenance or um, provides and housing for the uh, uh, mother and the child and so on. This kind of agreement, uh, once uh, it can be made as a binding uh, order, then uh, that can be enforced also in state A. And that uh, is also a useful mechanism. It can be used um, also for uh, in Asian countries, in my eyes. 
if we come to um, judicial assistance, um, service evidence and apostille conventions have been quite successful in Asia as well. If it comes to cross-border business transactions, then um, nowadays we should think about um, how to um, guarantee um, an effective mechanism of dispute resolution. In that respect, um, although uh, arbitration um, has been an effective me mechanism thanks to the 1958 New York Convention, um, litigation has not been so uh, effective because um, the um, recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments have not been guaranteed uh, in uh, many uh, countries in Asia. So particularly, mainland China um, has uh, 33 bilateral treaties for uh, recognition and enforcement of judgments, so that uh, with these countries, um, they have an uh, effective mechanism of the um, enforcement of foreign judgments. However, because mainland China and South Korea and Japan respectively require reciprocity for the enforcement of foreign judgments, so far, between mainland China and South Korea, or mainland China and Japan, there are no possibility of recognizing or enforcing judgments. And that hampers um, the uh, free circulation of judgments in the region. Mainland China has become um, generous in accepting um, reciprocity uh, in the recent court decisions, so that reciprocity has been uh, acknowledged in relation to Germany, Singapore, and the US, so that we hope that uh, things develop uh, in the future. But uh, still, in order to guarantee effective mechanism of recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, I think uh, the 2005 Hague Choice of Court Convention uh, provides a useful mechanism. And um, uh, so far, uh, from Asia, Singapore uh, is the only country that has become the member state. And mainland, uh, uh, excuse me, China has signed um, already, and uh, uh, the ratification is uh, uh, awaited. And it would be uh, helpful to have this mechanism. And uh, I do hope that more uh, countries from Asia join the 2005 Choice of Court Convention, so that uh, circulation of judgments can be guaranteed. And um, in addition to that, the ongoing judgments project will uh, certainly be helpful to establish legal settings for an effective mechanism of uh, the enforcement of foreign judgments. Um, if we think about uh, what kind of uh, possible path uh, can be sought by the Hague Conference, um, a lot of issues have already been addressed, so I do not want to repeat all the points uh, that have been addressed already. Um, in my eyes, first of all, um, it would be helpful to have a um, bottom-up approach so that uh, we try to find practical needs from local representatives or stakeholders sometimes so that uh, we can address uh, with uh, instruments the practical needs uh, in the future. And uh, also, um, because um, particularly Asia has certain particularities in family law institutions and particular needs in my eyes. Um, perhaps we could also think about um, adopting an instrument in the future that uh, address the particular needs of the certain region that uh, may be different from other regions, but still that can be a useful mechanism. And particularly in Asia, there is no supranational body to adapt um, private international instruments uh, like EU or OAS. In that respect, uh, the Hague Conference um, plays an important role in my eyes. As far as the legislative work is concerned, we can probably think about the utility of non-binding instruments and the di distinguish in what kind of matters we do need binding instruments as conventions and in other matters where model law principles or legislative guides uh, can be useful to have um, a soft instrument that um, um, give guidelines um, for states um, that helps um, implementing these rules as a national legislation or help interpreting existing national statute in applying them uh, in certain cases. Um, as far as instruments um, concerned, um, we probably do not have to limit ourselves to a traditional sense of conflict rules or jurisdiction rules in the future, but in certain areas, there may be uh, useful to have substantive rules or also seek um, achieving regulatory functions uh, 
in that respect. So um, uh, in our parentage and surrogacy project, we are uh, so, uh, seeking uh, package instruments, uh, as Professor Basado mentioned yesterday. And uh, if possible, uh, we are also uh, thinking about uh, having some uh, substantive rules to give a regulatory function for the instruments. And that can be uh, also sought as a future method in other areas in my eyes. As far as possible uh, developments uh, are concerned, we can think about secure transactions as a matter um, for the future projects, as uh, Professor Basel mentioned yesterday. Intellectual property uh, may be also interesting if we uh, can uh, agree with um, adapting model law or principles in a, a soft mechanism, then uh, intellectual property, which is um, a delicate issue in some respect, but um, can be also uh, a useful project um, of the Hague Conference. And maritime law, we have certain cases in Japan where uh, complex rules are not yet clear and we have practical need to have um, concrete uh, rules for um, determining the applicable law, particularly um, for uh, public sales. Um, and that can be also a matter uh, that can be sought in the future. And also data protection, which is becoming a worldwide problem nowadays. And uh, I think uh, there are plenty of areas where the Hague Conference uh, can provide a useful work. And uh, we do hope that uh, we can uh, continue contributing to the uh, further development of the Hague Conference. So thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. And thank you. Yuko, thank you very much indeed. Also here, lots of uh, food for thought and ideas for, for the future, bottom-up approach, practical relevance of the work. I think that's certainly uh, very much uh, on our minds as well. Certain regions, or s sometimes it's difficult to identify a specific regions, so or it's just a group of states that have particular interests that they would like to, uh, to push forward. We see this currently with uh, the tourism project, for example. Um, interesting proposals, I think at the end of the day, it, it comes down to two things. Uh, first, a discussion, a proper discussion, what consensus means at the organization. I think that is the very fundamental bottom line of all of that. And uh, I hope we, we, we can have, either here or in another forum, a discussion on this, what I call the asymmetric consensus that would allow for some flexibility and states to, to move ahead, supported by the overall agreement of the organization as such that resources are being allocated to specific projects that may not necessarily immediately serve the interests of the entire membership. But again, that's a very delicate discussion uh, to have and it's for the members of course to have this uh, discussion and um, not for 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 us or we can we can feed that discussion but it's for the members of course to uh, to decide substantive rules regulatory um, uh, frameworks yes um, um, there is of course the statute um, that certain uh, Few people might see as an obstacle to these uh, developments, but uh, again, we're here to rock the boat. Thank you very much indeed to uh, participating in in these efforts and for providing us with all these um, ideas, Yuko.